So I guess it reinvigorated how I felt about the industry. Suddenly I felt like, oh, I can relax. I have a process. I, I know what to do now when I get given a script. It, it doesn't actually matter if it's sides for an audition or if it's uh, an episode of The Archers or if it's a video game or um, any kind of drama. I know now what to do. I know how to develop this character. I know how to get to the heart of them and what the process is to to really start creating a real human, a living person, and be able to inhabit that. Hello, how are you? Welcome back to the Spiritual Psychology of Acting podcast. This week's episode is all about acting in audio drama and features a conversation with the very talented Emerald O'Hanrahan. After leaving drama school in 2009, Emerald won the Carlton Hobbs bursary and has since worked extensively with the BBC, featuring in many productions, but is perhaps most well known for playing Emma Grundy in The Archers. As well as having a varied television career, Emerald has also worked for over a decade in video games, appearing in Alien Isolation, Assassin's Creed, and the soon-to-be-released Baldur's Gate 3. She gives great insight on what it's like to work on these productions, and the unique challenges that each job brings, She was a real joy to talk to, and it's a lovely chat. So, without further ado, let's get into it. We're very pleased to welcome actor Emerald O'Hanrahan to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Emerald, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. It's very exciting. No problem at all. How are you doing today, John? Well, I'm very well, thank you. I'm really pleased to have Emerald here. She's our first lady guest that we've had. Very good. <laughs> so that's good. Excellent. And uh, so we've got a really interesting subject today, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. So acting in audio drama, which uh, you're very experienced to talk about today. That'd be great to get into later, but it's always nice to get a bit of context. So I think to start us off, it'd be lovely to hear about your journey into acting. When did you first want to be an actor? How did you first get into it? All that kind of stuff. So I I always wanted to be an actor. It was like always my plan. And my family used to tell me that I announced to them when I was three that I was going to be an actor. I said I was going to be an actress. And my sister, who was tiny, she was like one, said, um, I want to be a mattress. And she, she just <laughs> loves lying down. <laughs> so, but it was always the plan. That was always my kind of thing. So that was... I always felt really lucky in a way that I knew where I was going. And when stuff was tough, I always knew, well, I'm going to survive because I'm going over there and I'm going to do that. I'm getting out of here and I'm going to do that. Um, But it also, but I used to be quite jealous of friends that were like, I don't know what to do. And maybe I'll go to university and study this or that. And I was like, no, I'm going to drama school because I've been an actor. And it slightly ruined me when um, I found out you needed two E's at A level to get into most drama schools and I was like well I don't need to bother at all then um <laughs> so when stuff got tough and I was about 15 I sort of quit everything and didn't didn't uh regret that but um yeah so that was always the plan and I and I did I started doing like a drama lessons when I was about 10 and and plays and stuff um around Cambridge where I grew up did the Christmas shows and summer shows and stuff at school, but it was always more my, I felt like my lot, my tribe was outside school at drama. Um, I had an amazing drama teacher when I was a kid called Jackie Cunningham, who um, at the Mackenzie School of Speech and Drama, and I did all my Lambda exams and stuff and, and, and always was obsessed with voice, sound, how voice was created. I was obsessed with Shakespeare and poetry and and the sound of stuff and how how um and words, just words, words, words. And I watched a lot of films, loads of black and white films and loads of I was obsessed with things being old fashioned and loved the Victorians and the old fashioned stuff. But I was I was really obsessed with um with plays and radio drama and and used to listen to a lot with with my granny who I lived with for a for a while um and my dad's side of the family my granny my grandfather who we called my papa teddy were musicians they're all classical musicians on that side so it felt like the way all that came out in me was through the sound of of acting 
I love all of it. I love theatre. I love screen. But I feel easy and and most at home with audio work. Yeah. So where do you think that came from? You had, had it so early on in in your life that you you were set out to be an actor. Yeah. Is it just, I don't it's that know. far I mean, back that you don't really know, I guess. I don't know. It felt like it was always, I mean, I don't want to sound, but it it did feel like it chose me and that like that's what I want. Um I have my family were all sort of artists. My mum was a was an artist, was an illustrator and visual artist. My dad was a musician. Um, my grandparents were musicians on his side. So there was art was everywhere, but there weren't any actors in my family. And certainly nobody knew about the business of acting or anything. I felt really green coming into it about that. Really kind of, you know, I'm still learning sort of everything. But it felt very much like that's why I'm on the planet. And I, and I felt grateful to be like, that's my my purpose. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Well, it, it, it might have started in a previous life. I, I, sure. I had a, a student once who told me that his dad, uh, who was in his late 70s, had suddenly started training as a dancer. Oh, wow. And he wow. asked his dad, like, Dad, what, why, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> and he said, well, I've decided, you know, in the light of this life I've lived now, you know, working in offices and 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 whatnot is I don't want that next time so next time I've decided I don't want to be a dancer so I thought I might as well just start my training now <laughs> get ahead of the game yeah. I do have my my great aunt my 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 dad's aunt his um my my papa Teddy's sister um was a musical prodigy and by the time she was eight she was like supporting the family with her <clears throat> she was a pianist and she um pretty much single-handedly I think that she organized these lunchtime concerts through London um through the war and she kept music live music going through the war and when there was air raid sirens they would just carry on and wow. um and she ended up teaching the king and uh, princess Anne at the palace when they were kids and she could have been uh, I think it's interesting she went into teaching rather than carry on performing but but people always said that I was a lot like her so there's there's performance stuff that's in the family. It just came out in a new way, I think, with me. Well, my mum's side of the family, there's lots of interest in words and art and drama and that kind of stuff. And do you sing as well? Yeah, I love singing. I love it. Um, I'm not properly trained in it. And that's a big sort of, uh, I feel sad about that. But I, I really love it. Yeah. Well, it's never too late. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it was a really creative and nurturing mm. household for the arts. Like you were kind of surrounded by everything yeah so there was, nice was loads there was always loads of music loads of books it was yeah lots of art yeah so when so you it wasn't strange to your parents then that you you wanted to be an actress it would have been like really weird if I'd have gone into finance or um <laughs> announced I wanted to be a lawyer they would have been like no I don't think so <laughs> it's like the opposite <laughs> journey really isn't it usually people come totally. from that kind of and yeah the artist is <laughs> the black sheep of the family yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, oh god we've got a mathematician I know, they wouldn't have known <laughs> what to do <laughs> they would have disowned you <laughs> yeah but they would have done they would <laughs> so like get, get into voice acting was that did it kind of just mm -hmm. happen naturally because of your love of it or how did that all come about it did really um i i have an amazing friend uh, called nick warburton who's uh, a playwright and uh writer of all sorts of things but he's got uh, an amazing radio drama career and um, he's actually the godfather of my baby. And he was a real, um, uh, like um, a total mentor for me growing up. Um, I met him when I was doing uh, amateur theatre in Cambridge and um, and he directed a play I was in and then another play. And um, I went and observed a radio drama that he was doing that he'd written because the writer is so part of the process with radio drama which is just gorgeous. You generally have the director and the writer sitting together for the couple of days you're making the radio drama. Um, and, and so the word is really important. You don't want to sort of go too far off the lines or anything because the writer's right there. You don't want to annoy them. And, um, yeah. and generally they're really, it, it's very collaborative with the writer. And so I went and observed a piece that he was doing. Um, and so I got to see how radio drama was made just before I went to drama school. It was like this summer, I think, before I went. And I was so inspired by that. And I heard about the Carlton Hobbs Radio Drama Bursary Award competition. And um, so what that is, each drama school chooses their 
candidates, I think it's about six candidates, maybe eight, um, that go up, or is it four? Can't remember. They train them in the radio drama stuff, and then they go to the BBC and you do like an audition day, basically, all the different drama schools um, in the in the conference. Um, or at least that's how it was done when I was at drama school, which is a little bit of a while ago. Um, and then the BBC choose their four or have many people for a for a contract and it's like your first job out of drama school is learning and being paid and doing all the audio stuff across BBC radio so mainly radio 4 but radio 4 extra radio 3 different stuff and and lots of different all the different plays um readings for concerts on radio 3 really interesting cool stuff and I was like I want that that's the what I want when I come out of drama school so I went into drama school knowing about that and I'd done a lot of voice work growing up as a kid so I I sort of voice was very not easy but very familiar for me and I and learning all this there were some actors who come in sort of from a physical way and I was really nervous physically and it took me about a year and a half at drama school to realize I wasn't just like that that I that I actually had a body I wasn't just a disembodied head and voice so it's much more comfy for me to just be a voice <laughs> um but I yeah I wanted that Carlton Hobbs and I was really like <clears throat> aiming for that and I guess visualizing it without really realizing what I was doing but I was definitely in active imagination picturing it all happening and picturing myself at the BBC working and um and I and I got it and I was just so like thrilled. It was an amazing training straight after drama school to go to the BBC. And that was my like daily job for five months. And it was so, so fun. Wow. And I was saying a lot while I was there because I was always a listener of the Archers. I listened with my granny and it was very, it, she was a, she was like my mom. And um, she really, she brought me up a lot. And I used to just, uh, so it was a very, it was a very precious thing with us, the archers. And every single day you couldn't talk to her between like 7.02 and 7.15 because you just had to listen to the archers. And my grandfather listened to it every day as well because he was always there, but he didn't know a thing about what was going on. He would just tune out completely. But my granny had listened from the very beginning. And so when I got to the BBC, everyone was going, oh, you'll get a role in the archers. Everyone from the rep goes up because you you go on to the, the repertory company. It's like the last rep ever, I think, um, because it's that old style of learning and doing all the plays. Yeah. And it's your one company doing it, it was so cool, um, but all audio work. And so I was waiting to be called up to go and do my like solicitor or you know do my day on the archers and and I wasn't called and I was so annoyed and I kept going I want to be on the archers I just I really want to be on the archers and um and I wasn't called and I wasn't called and it was coming to the end of the five months and I was like I'm doing lots of really exciting things and that's brilliant but I really want to go up and do the archers <laughs> and then I got a call from a private number on one of my days off I was like I don't really want to answer that and um and it was one of the execs at the at the archers and she said, um, we've got a, we, we're thinking of recasting a character. And um, I just want to know, um, I know you, you're you good with accents and stuff. And do you think you could match her voice? And I was like, yes. <laughs> um, who is it? <laughs> and then uh, she said, it's Emma. Um, we're recasting Emma. And I knew every character because I listened always. And I really didn't like Emma. She'd had quite a wild um, past. And uh, and I like as a listener, I just didn't approve of her. And so it was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, OK. Um, and I found pictures of Felicity Jones, who was playing her at that time. She'd created the role and played her for 10 years, I think. Um, and she was phenomenal at playing her. She really created this beautiful, nuanced, huge, like real human. Um, and we don't look dissimilar. We've, I decided we've got quite a similar vocal tract, I think. We've got quite a similar kind of um, cheeks and neck and stuff. And I thought, OK, where she places her voice, yeah, I can sort of, I can do that. And um, and it's 
one of the kind of working class characters. So it's a, and it's, she's, she sounds quite brummy rural. And, um, and that's the, she'd done all the voice work matching the actor who plays her mum, the character of her mum. So she'd sort of beautifully made the voice match her mum's so that sometimes it was like, oh, she's going to turn into her mum when she's older. And you can really hear that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And so I was really keen on matching it properly. I'd been quite thrown as a listener when actors had changed um, and and the voice had changed. And I'd be like, that's not that's not her. That's not him. Um, so it was really, really mattered to me to do it properly. And also I've got purpose to be right purpose to be perfect blah 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 <laughs> um so i i got these two omnibuses sent to me on cd and i had my little cd walkman and i remember just listening to it on loop for like two weeks just and and writing it all out phonetically and um yeah just got obsessed with mimicking her properly and and yeah got that after i so i was waiting and waiting to do these like bit parts on the arches and being like i hope it's a nice bit part i want to do something you know meaty i want to do... and then and then was cast as emma to take over from from felicity when she was doing movies and stuff so it was really yeah that was cool and was there like a crossover day where one day it was felicity and then the next day it was you no they they did that quite um nicely where they they i think it had been a year of no vocal Emma lots of like oh Emma's over there and she looks happy or Emma's in the back or she's upstairs <laughs> so it had been a while that people um yeah they hadn't heard her but it was so daunting coming in and starting and doing it. it was really um yeah that was terrifying and I used to write out all her on, on the on the scripts I used to write phonetically how Felicity would say each word and then it took me a six months or something to like relax and start trusting that I could I could just sound like her and then and then start developing the character how how I how I play her rather than just sort of trying to match how Felicity would say that word yeah 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 I suppose over, t- over time it would become your own wouldn't it yeah and it has it's beautiful I've, I mean I'm so lucky I've been playing Emma for 13 years and did, did the audience nice. notice actually not most of them I'm sure some people really? did but that's the that's the biggest feedback I get when people come up to me they say you look completely wrong it's like yeah no <laughs> and um and I didn't know that the actor had changed and that's just the best compliment I love that because I, I that really mattered to me what does the character of Emma look like is she, is she you know you know if if you're as an actor if you're playing um I don't know an old man mm. Uh, it's it's kind of you as an old man. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? You might have different facial hair, but it's not like you're a completely different human being. Mm. But what about when, when when you're doing this? Does the character of Emma does she look different to you? Does she have yeah. the same color eyes as you? No. I mean, I, I the joy of radio and all audio work is that you can play an octopus or a complete an alien or something. You know, it's like fantastic. Yeah. You're not you're not held back by your physical form. Um, and that it's different for everyone. The pictures are the best and they're in everybody's heads, they're different. And so I know Emma looks different for every listener. But for me, she's got kind of dirty blonde hair. She's got blue eyes. She's a very different physicality from me. It's really, it's very cool. I could never be cast as So if you were doing a scene within the drama, I don't know if you ever are, where Mm. Emma is getting ready in front of a mirror, Mm. would you be picturing what, right? Yeah, what, what she, what you think she looks like. Well, the good thing is you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the mirror getting ready in front of it because it would bounce the sound off. So it would be, so you can, you'd pretend. <laughs> so, but you, your <laughs> imaginary mirror. But my imaginary mirror would, she'd look very different. So I wouldn't have the distraction of my own face. Yeah. <laughs> to get in the way of what Emma looks like. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's fascinating. The whole. So, you, do you use? Do you think you use your imagination more for radio than you do for? Like film acting, I guess, because it's, it's in camera, it's all kind of real, I guess. Even stage acting, you're that's on a set. interesting, isn't it? I guess on, on set, I tend to, that's something that's really helped doing John's work, has really helped with. I I got the opportunity to, we were meant to do an episode, um, film an episode of Agatha Raisin. I, we were doing costume fittings and stuff on the 22nd of March in 2020 and everything got canned. And we all got our jobs back and we made it the next year. It was like, I think it was April 21. 
just amazing. It was really cool that they brought us all back to do it. Um, and the crew and everything I was so pleased. And I'd been studying with John for about a year at that point. So I got the chance to put into practice everything that we'd, well, not everything, some of what we'd been learning. And that was so brilliant. The the relaxation and the the solidity from the work was so cool because because I haven't I've got quite a lot of experience with audio work but not so much with screen and I love it I love it all um but because I haven't got all that wealth of experience with screen work and because I'm not I don't understand the camera like I understand a microphone it's it's not as relaxing or as relaxed but being able to just pause take a moment feel the floor offer it up just beautiful was able to then drop myself I mean what at your, in your best self obviously it sort of comes and goes but drop it be the character be with the character and that's it and so when stuff's being like deconstructed around you on set like you know the the part of the room that the camera can see looks right and then you've got all the rest of it that's been that's like there's people everywhere and that's not right and there's you know so yeah. I think the imagination is really vital for everything. It's like in theatre, yeah. you're ignoring the audience or you're trying to, you know, create that fourth wall. Um, I think it's vital in all of it, but in slightly different ways. Yeah, yeah but the, the, there's two really, there's two different things. Is mm. is that uh, as an actor, you, you, you say, for example, you're doing something with green screen, mm. you're imagining... The Everything. outer yeah. attention. So basically, there, there's yeah. inner attention. There's outer attention. Yeah. Outer attention is what meet you meet through your senses. Um, but mm. outer imagination is imagining the circumstances. So say you're in a play, uh, and there was no, uh, you know, it was it was um, there was there was no actual props. And you're imagining everything. It's just you in a in a you know in, in a in a spotlight, mm. and you're imagining all the things, much like a mime or mm-hmm. something like that. Then then what you're doing is you're having outer outer attention, but outer imagination. Mm. But yeah. also, of course, how we think most of the time is in inner imagination. Mm. So if I say, you know, would you like a cup of tea? You imagine the cup of tea. Uh, or if you say to me, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to the shops and, and buy a Mars bar, you see a Mars bar in your head and that's all inner imagination. Mm. So whether you're doing um, film acting, uh, theatre acting or audio acting, most of the characters thoughts are inner imagination. But when you're doing a, a film, you don't have to work so much on the outer imagination mm. unless it's a green screen kind of situation, because, of course, You've got the props. You've got the. Mm. You've got everything is actually there. You've got the other act. You've got the other characters. Mm. But in your situation, doing audio acting or doing green screen, you need to have a really well primed both outer and inner imagination. Mm. And it depends on the sort of audio. Like with with a lot of radio drama, you're doing it for real. So you're with the actor, with the other actors in the scene, the other characters. You've got props. You've got someone being your arms because you're holding your scripts or you're looking at your scripts so you need to sound like you're making a cup of tea but you've got somebody doing the spot effects and making the cup of tea um so there's so your outer imagination is is there somewhat needs to be there to block out a few things just like screen I would say but some but some props are there and the people are there that helps but then in other audio work it's just you in a booth and everything's done in post-production so you're you're it's you and the microphone and you've got the other actors are around you but you can't see them because you're in a little booth in your own box and you can hear them in your in your headphones but you can't so you so then you need everything that's just like yeah like green screen so is there is the process of working on the archers then is that different from all other kind of radio drama experiences all video game experience i know you've done a lot of video games Mm. as well is, yeah, the archers, is the archers different to all of that? I think it is, yeah. I think I mean it's similar to to radio to other radio drama, but it's faster. Um mm. and I think technically it's recorded a little bit differently, um, but it feels a bit different where um 
where things are like played in live like um if you're in a cafe and you've got music in the background generally you'll have the music playing so you can hear it but then in some in some radio drama you've got that too um because of the various licensing laws with children generally if you've got children they're played in as a sound effect so they're recorded first usually yeah. or you leave a gap and they're recorded after but you're not with the right. child until they get a bit older so that's interesting that's different yeah yeah, yeah. so is, what's is it- the turnover what, what between you know you getting the script and mm. you actually recording the episode so they do they're generally about six weeks ahead of what's being aired and generally get I get my scripts maybe a week if I'm lucky before I'm in sometimes it's just uh, a few days but usually it's around a week um and then you've got time to prep the scripts and do your work before you because it's so fast once you're in you have a read through with everyone um out of the studio and then you go in scene by scene with the actors in your scene um and generally you'll get a, a rehearsal which is usually recorded which I'm a big fan of because you never know what's going to sort of come up. And then maybe and you usually get one more, maybe another and pick ups. So it's fast. It is fast. Does anybody learn their lines or do they want you to have the, those scripts in hand just in case you do make a mistake or in case you go off? Yeah, no, you, the, the, the culture of audio work is generally you don't learn your lines at all. <clears throat> so you have your yeah. script always. There's one person on the archers who always learns his lines because he's blind. So he's sent yeah. his scripts as audio files and they're like a robot speaking with all the lines and then he learns it from that. He's extraordinary. He works wow. much harder than any other actor on the <laughs> Right, yeah. He's brilliant, Ryan Kelly. Yeah, yeah, he's fab. And what happens when you have to turn the page? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. This is like the art yeah, yeah, yeah. of page turning. Is <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. And I've always been quite neurotic about um, making page noises and paper noises, like this huge thing. So you tend to use music stands and have your pages on there and also learn how to, some people can turn them really beautifully, like silently. Most actors I've worked with do that, but I don't trust myself to do it at all. I've got quite shaky hands. So I hold them and so I hold two and then have the rest on a music stand. I mean, the best is when you've got a scene that's one page and just hold the the pages and then you don't have to worry about a page turn at all. Uh, do you, when, when you're recording those, so if you've got the script in your hand, you're not gesticulating what you say. No, that's true. Yeah, you kind of have to put all that energy through another way. I guess that's why the, that's the beauty of the, like, the nice thing about using a music stand is that you can then use your hand, but then you don't want to, you don't want to hit another actor or another actor's paper. So there is a sort of element of that performance technique of not moving your hands a bit too much, because also it might get in if you're then speaking like that and it's going to affect the audio yeah um with your hand in front of your mouth <clears throat> or um or hitting i mean but maybe other people know where their hands are better than i in space <laughs> right. but um but there is that thing about putting it through the voice whereas like on screen the eye is like everything and yeah. choosing where you're looking choosing when you're blinking even but in audio work, the expression is all through the voice and the breath. So it's channeling that energy, I guess, rather than like if you were gesticulating, you might so. lose some of that vocal energy. It's... I think so. Yeah. 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 What if you're doing a romantic scene? Mm. Do, do you actually kiss? Sometimes. Or, you know, are they the other side of the microphone? And yeah. You're, if you, they're you sort of. Make the noises. I mean, well, how do you do that? <laughs> so normally, <laughs> normally you've got, so the microphone has like a cone shaped arc. Um, and that's the audio picture is, is in that. So like the lens of a camera has has a sort of field of vision. The mic does, but it's an audio vision. Um, so you'll be on the left of mic is, you know, in the left of the room or right of mic. Or if you're central, you're kind of with that person who's central on the mic. So if you're having a kind of intimate moment, you'll both want to share the central space in the mic. and Sometimes you do like kiss or m- more commonly you kiss your hand. You both kiss your hand because then you're not 
affecting the audio with anything you're not turning your face or getting everything can stay um pointed directly at the at the mic so you're not going to affect the audio picture and you can and you can keep your heads close together so it doesn't sound like you've got really long lips but um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah generally you kiss your own hand which yeah, I loved yeah. coming into like into the industry and I was 23 or whatever I was like great no one checked anybody <laughs> it's my own hand keep myself to myself <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh, handy handy i love you handy <laughs> <laughs> exactly. you can practice at home as well exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i guess is the is the archer then i guess the, the kind of a, a radio equivalent of soaps because it's such a quick turnaround is that the closest thing? yeah i'd say it is a got? soap yeah 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 and um i yeah, long running audio drama is how I think it's described. Right, and, uh, yeah, yeah. and it started out having uh, an educational like remit. Um, it was about educating people about farming and what happens at what time of year. Oh, but now yeah. it's and, and I think it was from like the farming budget or something. Um, right. I might have that wrong. But um, now it's it's entertainment and it's but it does have an agricultural advisor. And so it's it's generally it is informative but it's like and 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 some of the what I really love about and what I always loved about the show was that everything happens in real time like you know there's that thing about like soap characters have the most eventful lives of anybody it's like <laughs> unbelievable yeah yeah but actually I think in the archers like you generally it is like because everything tends to unfold in real time it's not sped up um it's just these little 15 minute segments every day of people's lives and big things happen but big things happen in people's lives so it always it feels real you feel like um it, it doesn't feel melodramatic it feels yeah, it's more like, relatable um, I guess yeah I wonder yeah I don't know I think it's um yeah it is it's definitely a soap and um yeah. and it's lovely being part of that kind of family but it's it's a it's a different pace i think radio's a different pace yeah so for, for the character obviously you said you took over from felicity jones and there's that mm. six months or so of matching and kind of getting into that do you then yeah, because maybe you, even longer right yeah well i mean obviously you've played her for so long now do you get kind of a say in how the character develops you know do you kind of get to make the character more your own or you know how, how does that so. kind of process and develop yeah interesting I think I've played her now for 13 years it's a long time yeah, yeah um and what a gift like as an actor to have a job that's going on that long and and you go up like it's once a month you record the if you're in the story they you know pick and shoot your storylines ebb and flow um but generally going up every month every few months and Obviously, I have no say in what the events are that happen to her. You're yeah. getting the scripts and going, oh, wow, okay. Or like, oh, where's this going? And the director's like, I don't know. And you sort of, and then in a few months, you're like, ah, it's going there. So you never know what's going to happen just like in life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, I think they probably respond to what, I think the writers respond to what they're, what they're hearing and people respond to, I'm sure even subconsciously people are responding to, the you bring yourself don't you to whatever role you're playing it's just like any acting you're you're playing the role but of course you're bringing your whole experience in your life because you can't detach yourself completely from that yeah so I'm sure there's elements of um of my life that I've brought into you know unconsciously in terms of relaxation I don't I don't worry anymore so much um unless I haven't been in for a little while I'm like oh what's her voice but um <laughs> But that trust that I, I mean, I know her so well and I'm like the custodian of her story. I remember all the events that have happened in the last 13 years, well, not all of them, but, you know, the major ones that have happened to her and her development, her development as a person and what feels like, oh, yeah, this is really, this is really interesting. This feels really left field. And would Emma do this? And it's like, well, of course, because you can't get into like my character would never do this because okay. people do really unexpected things in life people something happens to someone someone says something to someone and they act in a way that they would never dream of acting or they 
say something and they're like oh why did I say that you know it's, it's yeah, yeah. so it's really cool to trust the writing and the directors and just see where it goes with so I guess the the collaborative part is the chats that you can have is very fast but you can generally have chats go I'm thinking this is why she's doing this because of this in the past or this is and she's this sort of person and this is what how does that does that sound about right to you and the director saying yeah well maybe there's this and there's that and so there's there's lots of space to have that conversation about why these things might be happening why she might be saying this why yeah so in that way you've got that kind of freedom yeah I suppose in a in a um you know normally if you get cast in a film or you get cast in a play you have to you know create the character's past mm. you know a lot, a lot of that is you know what what is a character is it's a collection of experiences essentially that are stored as mental pictures mm. in in your mind um but if you're in a soap opera whether it's a, a tv soap opera or a radio soap opera you've actually lived the character's mm. past yeah yeah some of it yeah yeah it's just such a treat so then you've got like half the work is done you've got some of that sense data yeah yeah and then must, that, that must be, bring a get greater depth you see that mm. with some some in some soap operas that you know the character is just so well developed mm. because the actor, whether the actor you know knew how to create the character's past or not, it doesn't matter because over time they have got a path because yeah. they lived, they shot all those scenes, yeah. they lived all, all those experiences. Yeah. yeah, those conversations with those people, you had them. Yeah. 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 Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast. We really hope that you're enjoying it and you're learning lots from it. I just wanted to tell you that I'm doing a live workshop in London on the 15th and the 16th of September 2023. It's from 11 a.m. till 6 p.m. On those two days, it's a weekend. It's a Saturday and Sunday where if you've been listening to the podcast and you've been learning some of the information that we've been given, of course, for the information to become knowledge, we need to put it into practice. So here's your opportunity to come and put some of these things into practice and start developing your acting technique with the spiritual psychology of acting. Go to the website where you can find out about all our courses, including the six modules. You can study now remotely the entire course through all the modules with all the exercises from the comfort of your own home. But if you wanted to get in the room and receive some personal guidance, you know where to come. All the very best. Bye. You spoke earlier there about studying the spiritual psychology of acting with John and how obviously you were able to implement it when you went back to work. But it'd be great to hear a mm. bit more about what effect it had on your, your career, how it can change your mm. perception of acting. What was your overall experience of, of working with John? Oh, I just, I mean, I I do think it changed. It changed my life, really. I mean, that sounds a bit huge, but I, and I feel like I'm still embedding the work and and want to keep going with it because it's there's, it's so rich and um and so sort of paradigm shifting but um my husband Martin Delaney who's also a brilliant actor um that's that sounds like I'm a brilliant actor and he's also a brilliant actor he's a brilliant actor he's also an actor as well as I'm just gonna start that again <laughs> yeah, I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> um so Martin um, saw a tweet, I think, from Eddie Marsan saying that his teacher, John, was starting a course online. And this was during lockdown. And um, there was an introductory session online. And so we were like, I mean, it just sounded perfect because it sounded like all the stuff we were interested in, in one. I went to drama school. I went to the Bristol Vic and... We had a brilliant acting teacher in my first year and she left. And then I didn't feel like we had any acting training for the rest of the course. Um, and I learned a lot of dance styles and um, I'm sure I learned a lot, but I don't feel like I learned acting. 
I didn't, I felt completely unprepared for the industry coming out and I was terrified. Um, I mean, I could talk all day about drama schools and I would love to be part of reforming them. But so anyway, we'd, um, we saw this tweet and we thought we'd come along to the introduction and I just found the, the meditation and the talking about the spiritual side of it and the marrying it with Stanislavski's work and how John's developed that work so powerful and so um it just felt really like led and really like <clears throat> like a real um synchronicity to find him and so that really kept us going through that pandemic time really rough time but it was like I knew that on was it Thursday nights we were going to be rattling all the pots and pans out the window and I knew that on Monday nights I think we were going to be seeing John and and the people in the class and that connection and the learning was just so wonderful at a very very bleak time and so it was and so having the space to do it um, where we weren't rush off our feet and we weren't leaving the house. And I feel very lucky that I was in lockdown with Martin because we were able to talk all the time about the principles we were learning and practice stuff together and discuss and um, and do the homeworks together. So it was a really rich, exciting time. And I think because it was in the pandemic, there's something about I want to do it in life now and I want to embed the work more and and I love the um the American style of continuing training that you I really don't like the three years training and then you're done um I really yeah. want to I feel very hungry to keep improving and keep learning and developing and so the spiritual psychology of acting feels really um useful for that there's so much there and and it's so it's there's such a depth of and a wealth of the work there so I guess it reinvigorated how I felt about the industry it reinvigorated my own um process I felt suddenly I felt like oh I can relax I have a process I I know what to do now when I get given a script in any if it, it doesn't actually matter if it sides for an audition it would be more helpful if you get the whole script, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> you get the sides or if it's uh, an episode of The Archers or if it's a video game or um, any kind of drama, obviously a TV script, whatever. I know now what to do. I know how to develop um, this character. I know how to get to the heart of them and what the process is to um, to really start creating a real human a living person and be able to inhabit that it's quite it's quite shocking really if so, so you stand back from it it's quite shocking to to think and to hear that you know an actor goes to drama school and they do their three years training but they really come out and they realize that especially I had this a lot when people take the courses they realize they weren't they didn't actually learn how to act they weren't really trained mm -hmm. there was a lot of working on plays or doing improvisation mm, mm. or there's lots of <clears throat> tap dancing and and that kind of thing but the actual nuts and bolts of acting and I don't and I'm not aware of any drama schools that actually do it because I've taught students from all the drama schools mm. and they all tell me the same thing that we enjoyed our experience <clears throat> but we don't do what we do with the spiritual psychology of acting where we start with you know what is acting what's the purpose of theatre art uh, what's a character? How do you create a character? And then have a systematic process, step by step, of how to do it. In the same way that you know, if you trained as a doctor, you'd learn about human physiology and about medicine, etc. Or if you trained as an architect, you'd learn about aesthetics mm, and about mm. construction and engineering. Um, do you see what I mean? And you'd, yeah. ha you'd have a profession. But it's amazing that that the actors go to drama school and they're not actually they come out and they don't really have a profession because yeah. a profession means that you have a, a concrete knowledge and a set of internal mental pictures of how to do your job properly. Yeah, and I feel yeah. like for the first time I have I at least I have an inkling of that. I have I have the the I don't feel like I've um I don't feel like I've mastered my profession, but I feel like at least I know my steps now 
yeah, yeah. I think what what's with, with yours and with Marty's training is that you you've, you've been through the exercises and things mm. which we were able to do online I think what what you really need now is for me to direct you in a scene uh to go through to have a character to go through the whole sort of mm. process of analyzing the character creating all the EPOAs and the mind triad and programming it and then rehearsing it yeah uh, yeah you know and I'm 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 doing an intro in September on the I think it's the 16th and 17th of September I'm going to do a two-day intro in London and you know if there's sufficient interest there then we can start a monthly group and we can work towards putting on a showcase yeah it is is always important to to put it into practice I mean I had such a a similar experience that you know same thing with drama school that I, I loved my time at drama school it was you know I worked harder than I ever had my entire life learnt loads it was really inspiring and, and a whole bunch of fun as well but I, I remember as well I remember going to the spotlight and recording a monologue uh, for camera a couple of months after graduating and it just like I had no idea what I was doing I, I, I was terrified because I was just like I actually don't know what to do in this scene or in this monologue it did feel crazy that I had come out of drama school after all that but I still didn't quite have the confidence to know like you say like have the same confidence as a doctor going into their profession but and I think we come like, at a similar time as well. I think you know, with the pandemic, yeah. it was great to have that pause. That, you know, yeah, we were able to massively. to find it. But that is the the, the great joy of of being able to work mm. with you, John, on especially on the recording material. That is, you can work on it as well as working on your career. You don't have to pause completely. It's great. You kind of need to get it, let it all soak yeah. in. But it's great that it's just available, you know, for mm. everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is great. I felt like I hadn't got a clue, what, I, particularly with screen, I hadn't got a clue what I was doing because I'd never done screen before I went to drama school. I'd done a lot of theatre and I had sort of started looking at audio work, but I hadn't, I'd never done anything with screen. We, I wasn't a kid that was playing around with camcorders. It just wasn't in my world. We didn't have that um, in my family. Um, and so... I was expecting to learn more about that at drama school. We did embarrassingly little in my in my year group. Um, and but to not even know how to begin to approach a character for a for a, a television or for a you know for a show reel was that was terrifying. And it yeah. and it's been particularly with screen work, I've I've felt like a real um solidity. And a relaxation after after doing John's class, yeah, yeah, great. Well, it is. It's like it's, it's strange that you know most work is going to be on the screen when you when actors yeah. graduate from drama school, and yet <clears throat> so little is. Like it's great to have a classical training. That's like it's it's brilliant. It sets you up in some way, but at the end, of it, you kind of go, yeah, what does it actually set you up for? Like you know a lot. It does about it set you up for the industry as it is now? Well, exactly, I mean, we could then yeah. go into a different subject, but. But I don't know. I mean, of course, it's money, isn't it, to have access to a proper studio and cameras and people. But but it's vital, right? Like if you're running yeah. a drama school and you're and you're preparing young actors for the industry as it is now, it's a vital part of of the industry. In the same way, the fact that we guess we've got so much from John's teaching, and that was mm. all you know over Zoom online. Mm. We didn't need mm. a studio to set up to know how to act. That's the thing, I guess. That yeah. it's. You, you you get on set and that's when you can put it on to practice but yeah um, I guess that is the the failing of drama schools is that they don't actually prepare actors in the same way that John it's has not acting technique and it's not performance technique either exactly yeah yeah so going back into to to your career then mm. you, so you've, you've worked you said on 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 video games as well what is that experience like yeah, so that's really that can be very different depending on on which video game you're doing. So I've I've just finished. It's been massive. It's been five years. Five years? Yeah, I think so. On um, a game that's coming out in a month. I think I'm allowed to say now. Normally you have these NDAs that you can't say a thing and blah blah blah. Yeah. But now I can say that I've been part of um, Baldur's Gate three that's about to come out at the end of August. And it's this massive, it's going to be on every platform and it's a massive, it's almost open world. It's huge. Then there are these playable characters that could be anything, could be any species, any race, because in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, you've got everything. So uh, I've been 
all all aspects of Baldur's Gate humanity uh, and non-humanity, which has been really cool, really nuts. So not having in in a way you don't have any character to hang on um, or any narrative because you're dropping into moments in the game and recording. And I was doing the the, the body motion capture and the voice, but right. not the facial capture. They were doing that differently or separately. Um, but that was, and it was a very, it was a, it was basically my voice. So I wasn't doing um, loads of different characters with lots of different voices. So it'll be my voice and my, my body doing whatever kind of the, the, the actual player chooses to, to, to be. It's nuts. Wow. Just so cool. That was Did very different from any other. Did you see you're working on it for over five years? Yeah, wow. yeah, it was huge. It was huge, and we've just wrapped like two weeks ago, and my character was the last to wrap. It was mad. It was so like anticlimactic. It was like, "Yep, we're all done now. That game's finished." I was like, "Okay, bye." <laughs> <laughs> but it was really, really fun, and and dropping into like, right now you're in um, wherever you are, and this has just happened to you, and um, if you can just be. Um, be a level of emotion that's like it's very intense it's a very intense moment and everything's going on so it's but I mean just I mean I can't actually say any specifics because I'd probably be sued yeah but um yeah so that's really cool so that's the sort of current thing that's just about to happen so Um, so so that as well with the motion capture is that a whole other mm, side of that performance that you have to just bring in like it's well that's that's always developing um, and the technology is moving so fast. Like the first time I did a, a my first video game was um, playing Nina Taylor in uh, Alien Isolations. That's a game that's a, a few years ago now. Um, did it come out in 2010, something like that, um, around that time? Mm-hmm. And it was a massive game and it's quite a scary game. I haven't been able to play it because it's too frightening. <laughs> but we did all the motion capture and all the voice. So we were in this huge like aircraft hangar and the cameras all around. And it was a, a little bit like when I've watched the um, behind the scenes stuff of the Matrix, you know, you've got the cameras all at different levels and yeah. they're flashing. At, but it's it looks steady to the human eye, but they are flashing. And so it was kind of exhausting and mad. We had these headaches every day. It was so but and, and you're wearing a wetsuit covered in great big bobbles that are like tennis balls cut in half and all painted black. And it's literally green or blue. And you need total outer imagination for that because it's like you've got nothing. You've got each other, but you've got nothing. And then every game that I've done since then, it's got it's got smaller, it's got faster, it's got more slick. And this last game I was doing, it's in little, just normal rooms, studio rooms, and the cameras are tiny and they're all around and you don't notice um, the technology is probably completely different probably not flashing anymore or whatever you know but I, I've I've no idea about the technical side of that but um but it's but the the wetsuits are the same um not really wetsuits but like the the you wear the black kind of velt like half of velcro and then they put dots on you so they've they've got a lot smaller but stuff so that the so that the camera and the computer can pick it up and then you get translated into this whatever the creature is you're playing um yeah. so that's really cool seeing that how different it can all be so is it, is it easier now i guess that the technology is less cumbersome more kind of sleek that you, yeah it's there's less yeah performance thing i guess there's less to worry about i guess so yeah it's less it's like the 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 suits are less cumbersome it's less um it takes less time to to get in and out i did i did i was on um assassin's creed um the one set in victorian london and I was playing a baddie in that, which was really fun. And I was doing the facial capture in that and the voice. And um, and I had to wear this quite heavy, like camera rig on my face. And I had uh, dots on my face with um, like eyeliner pencil um, so that they could pick up everything and then translate it into whatever she really looked like. And um, And then I saw someone going in to do a, a different job when I was last um, in studio to do this this latest game, a completely different game, and someone was doing going into decent facial capture, and it was just it was it was so small and it was just nothing. It was like a little like a swimming cap, and nothing else. You know, like the technology moves so fast, and like even during the course of doing Baldur's Gate, we had 
these they they developed the technology to to read our hands so we had these massive gloves that had like um they had a usb card in them and and dots all over them and and they could and then you could do that and your character's moving their hand and you're moving your hand it's really but it's brand new before that you had um like fingerless gloves with the dots over your hand so it, it's it always starts it's it's high tech but it feels really like um <laughs> uh like robinson crusoe is that the right word right um, <laughs> and then it gets much more slick and more kind of like all oh, right yes this is the tech i would i would imagine yeah. But yeah, so it's so far. It's probably completely different now. Like it's moving so fast. Yeah, it's so like if... the brick mobile phones, isn't it? Exactly. Like a <laughs> yeah. brick with a massive yeah. aerial sticking out of it. <laughs> yeah. They seem hilarious Jeez, nowadays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's like, uh, it's, it's guess it's a game. So it's kind of tapping into that side of you as a kid, and it is as that kind of exploration. You're kind of creating these mad worlds that will appear on, mm. you know, in a computer game that people get to, to be completely invested in. I'm really interested as well about how, I mean, computer. There's been a whole revolution of, of video games in recent years, hasn't? It? I mean, things like The Last of Us being turned, being that yeah. being turned into a TV series rather than being adapted into a game. Yeah. So does, do you get a sense of that as well? That you've essentially been working in video games for a good 10, 15 years. That the that it's becoming more cinematic. It's becoming more. Yeah. The scripts are getting better. I guess the characters are getting more interesting. Is that is that the case? I guess it feels like. I mean, I, I yeah, I just love it, and the the money that's in games now is huge and um and I guess I think people are realizing that you can have these real richness of of characters that people can play it that you don't that it can just be just like any screen acting you can and you can have these you know massive stars coming in to do video games there's this like yeah. like the planet of the apes games and the you know there's it's the scope is so rich. It's it's so exciting. But I mean, The Last of Us was extraordinary, and and I didn't play it, but I my brother in law did, and he was um, and he was hooked to the show and saying how oh, like this was different from the game, and it reminds this bit reminds me. But I never felt like I was watching an adaptation of a game. I never yeah. felt like oh, this is the bit where it's like you know I'm watching somebody playing a game. Like it was so seamless as a the narratives are so. I think because you can include so much in a game, you really live a novel. It's just massive. To condense that down into a television series was so successfully it was yeah. just stunning. I guess as an audience as well, like there's you you can be invested in characters and you can like mm. you're saying with people have their own version of Emma from the archers yeah. in their head, their own version. But in a game, you're kind of you're getting involved in it. Like it's as an audience yeah, member, you're part of it. So it's, it? yeah. it's like, it's melding with the actors. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and as the player, you're almost an actor in it. It's very cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to go back into then just voiceover work in general, mm. what, yeah. How, how do you prepare? Do you do like vocal exercises? How do you keep your voice healthy? You know, what, what is your so, kind of. So the voice, so the audio drama world, I'd say is completely separate from the voiceover world. Um, right. Yeah. And I, and yeah, in terms of looking after, I, I do drink a ton of water. I love water. And I think particularly when I'm working, it's like, I mean, it's, it's the only thing that sort of does the job, but I know some people find water initially makes your voice a little bit, like a little bit dry or a little bit. And then, and so some people like swear by having like a bite of an apple and then carrying on or what, but I, I just love water. I think water does it. Um, and I do a lot of humming and that kind of stuff to, to warm up and like even just on the train or singing to a, humming along to a song or a chant or something on my way up. Um, and then I do do, um, like articulation exercises, um, tongue twisters and those sorts of things just to kind of oh, I'm trying to the lips the teeth the tip of the tongue exactly <laughs> we do I do actually use one from drama school it was like where you do all the vowels but you do papity peppity pippity poppity poppity and then you do it with the b's and the d's and the t's and s's and z's and yeah and that I find really pop a cat a petal it's all that yes <laughs> yeah. exactly that's that good <laughs> phrase <laughs> so what would you know for those who aspiring actors who want to get into voiceover work obviously you kind of forge that you know a whole career path for for yourself what advice would you give to to actors who want to get more into voiceover acting 
or a radio drama well, I think, that, you know, the whole world yeah the audio the audio world i'd say i'd um i think it's it's just like anything with acting if you in 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 any world like ideally i'd do everything i love every area you know but i guess i've always been slightly obsessive about sound and words and and audio plays and I always listened and so I think I think that's really important to listen and consume it listen to podcasts listen to podcast dramas listen to radio listen to radio drama listen to everything that you can get your hands on I used to listen to audio books all the time as a kid and I couldn't really sleep as a child so I used to listen to books on tape all the time and um and I had a little tape recorder with my with my books and we'd go around to car boot sales and find old tapes and um and actually, I know that now you have these cubes that you can um, get. Uh, they're like USB cubes, but they're like no screen things for kids. And you can get stories and audio things so that it's it's like it's analog, but it's not quite. And it's really cool. So there's you can still have that experience, I think, without having the actual physical tapes. But um, but yeah, I'd listen to everything. Listen, 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 discover what you think is good, what what you what you love what do you what genres are what what do you love as a genre you know I, I loved listening to Shakespeare and listening to different people do Shakespeare and different I used to listen to a lot of Noel Coward plays and loved how how the words were made by different actors and how they sounded and um and different voices lots of documentaries I love listening to documentaries and I think hearing it's just like I love watching documentaries I love watching real people and um and just and yeah I guess just do that magpie thing that's a, any good actor right just like take it all in that's what I'd sort of that's where I'd begin I mean, it is, but it's at the end of the day acting is acting isn't acting it? is acting yes yeah, yeah. I mean you know the real art and craft of acting is being able to create a character mm. and then allow it to manifest itself through your voice and body mm. whether that's being filmed mm. or whether that's in front of a microphone in a studio mm. it's still the same internal process yes some of the performance mm. techniques might differ but but the essential you know learning to act is the key to it really isn't it that's the key and that's the bit that never changes the process the um the stuff you do at home before the the sense data getting all the pictures and and doing the the uniting of the script looking at the text that that doesn't change i think there's there's specific technical things with there's specific technical things of course with screen there's specific technical things with audio work learning about the microphone learning about um have it having this sort of cone shape so always wanting to make sure your mouth is pointed at the mic like it sounds really basic but it like it's really easy like if we're talking it's really easy to sort of go up here and probably with the microphone it then sounds very different if I'm looking at the <laughs> you know as opposed yeah. to looking over here but with an audio with a radio drama mic if you're looking over there you'll sound like you're leaving the room um and so there's listening I think somehow getting the chance to and and it should be at drama school right like there should be wonderful studio facilities at drama schools um getting the chance to play around with a mic and and then listen back to what you've done oh right when I'm not not listening back to be like wow I really hate my voice and I hate the choices I've made it's like actually just listening to be like oh when I'm here in front of the mic as opposed to to the left in front of the mic it sounds like this and when I'm in front of someone else or when I put the music stand with my script behind the mic as opposed to in front of the mic sound you know is bouncing off there it affects the sound yeah learning those sort of technical things I think is 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 vital um but it's just like watching videos about learning the technical stuff about camera work it needs to be done but it but that's not that's not acting that's the yeah that's learning the technical stuff so that you can concentrate on your process and and turn up and relax because yeah. that's the whole thing, isn't it? It's relaxing. Well, hearing you talk about that it reminds me of I remember in my first year at drama school, maybe about five six months into the training, one of the tutors kind of took me aside and, and it was it was a really beautiful moment because he he remember him saying that that he'd because he was the one who auditioned me to get into the school and he said that I'd lost a lot of the spark. He could see that I was getting very like mm -hmm. serious and mm -hmm. just very you know in my head and mm. just looking kind of miserable and it was a real kind of wake-up call to go oh yeah I'm kind of I see what I'm doing it was 
real kind of breakthrough of awareness for me. It seems like for you as well, that, that's kind of what it is. It's, it's about staying inspired and keeping yourself interested. And that comes across yeah. for you that you just, you, you have this real fascination with audio, this fascination with, mm. you know, performance technique and, and, and all the kind of, you know, saying like documentaries, everything it just is, it's fascinating to you. And I think that's, mm, that's what will, will keep actors going, isn't it? Is that they have to keep their imaginations, you know, sparking. You have to keep the inspiration up. And I think it's no no accident that you have this great career, and you go back to you know saying you did before you even get into drama school. You had this you know knowledge of of how your voice sounds and stuff. And it's it's I think actors can be quite lazy. I think and and <laughs> and not very proactive. But I think this is you think you're a testament to that that you you stay inspired. You stay you know have a, have a real joy and love, and you keep that that fire going. That's where the career eventually leads because people flock to that. I think. Oh, that's lovely. I hope that's true. I I, yeah. I do think that um, that the spiritual part of John's spiritual psychology of acting is is a vital part of being able to stay inspired, because you're every day you're taking yourself away from all the stuff that accumulates. You know, you're you're sitting back, you're meditating, you're letting everything go and actually that was a huge thing that changed everything I used to ask all the time at drama school what do you do to get rid of the trauma like obviously one carries one's own traumas but the trauma of of the character how do you not take that home with you how do you get rid of the character at the end of the performance and just learning the techniques with John learning how to let go and learning how to come back to what's real I mean, it's so helpful in life. It's so helpful if I wasn't an actor, but it's it's really given me the the tools and the framework to to be free, to live freely. And obviously, it's an ongoing process, and we're all human, and we all fall short, and all of that. But but learn knowing it's 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 not just the solidity of knowing I have an acting process, which is extraordinary, and like it's wonderful to to be like ah oh, yes that's what it is that's what i need to work on and perfect and and do you know and 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 practice but it's also i have a spiritual framework i know what i need to do when i'm feeling jangly or or a bit um mean or a bit um i i've i'm you know i've had a rejection from an audition or you know i've i've not had an audition for a while or, or whatever it is that I need to get back into that state of inspiration. I need to get back into why am I doing this? What do I, what's my purpose? And, and the spiritual side of the, of the work is what's so um, freeing and, and life enhancing. Well, it's in the word, isn't it? Exactly. Inspiration mm. is from the Latin in spiritus, mm. which means to be in spirit mm. and spirit is the word spirit is synonymous with consciousness mm. and the basis of the whole course, you know, that the spiritual basis of the spiritual psychology of acting is essentially the ongoing work of a, of an artist to raise their own level of consciousness. Um, consciousness is spirit. It's the same thing. You know, if you want to sound more scientific, you will use the word consciousness. <laughs> uh, but really it, we're talking about the same thing to be in spirit is to be in consciousness. And that's why, you know, the students are provided with effective meditation techniques to allow them to go back into their own being and consciousness mm. and refresh, you know, to, to go backstage, as it were, mm. uh, and refresh so that they can come out anew. And as the Shankaracharya says, that he says that um, meditation allows you to have um, new and fresh mornings of life. I love that. You've been listening to the Spiritual Psychology of Acting podcast. Thank you once again to Emerald O'Hanrahan. If you're enjoying the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe, tell everyone about it, leave a review, send us an email, and help support us over on Patreon. The link to our Patreon page is in the description below. As always, your continued love and support for us is really appreciated. Please join us again next week when we'll be taking a fascinating look into shadow purposes. 
it is an episode not to be missed. Until then, take care and we'll see you next time. Thank you to Charlie Robinson. She helps with the video editing and artwork for this podcast. And to Omid 16 b for providing the music. The track is called Love and is available on all streaming platforms. Thank you.